I'm going to stand up and pray real fast. <clears throat> Rudy, can I ask you to see if you can find me some water? water? Just so I can tell that I'm going to start coughing. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, in the name of one God, amen. Dear Lord, we thank you for this chance, Lord, just to be in your presence, Lord, to be in your home. For truly good, you give us all good things, Lord. And I thank you today for today's message, Lord, for you spoke it to me so clearly. And I ask that you, uh, that you give me the gift of prophecy, Lord, that I might deliver your word to your people, Lord. I ask that, the, that this upper room, Lord, be filled with the Holy Spirit right now. For it is your promise whenever two or more gather in your name, Lord, that you will, you will be in our midst. So, Lord, I ask that you wrestle with hearts, Lord. I know that there are specific aspects of our life that you want us to apply this to, Lord. And um, I ask that at the end, Lord, that uh, like in today's gospel, Lord, that this will be good seed that takes root and gives good fruit. And I ask this uh, in your holy, precious Son's name. Here's where we pray, thankfully, one voice saying, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses. As we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not to temptation, but those who make Through Christ Jesus, our Lord, for the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Okay, so I will tell you guys, I know that we are in the middle, or we're, not, we're probably at the tail end of like our parable series that we've been doing, but... Um, we're not going to do a parable today, and I will tell you personally speaking, when I, was, um, when I was preparing for the next parable, I had already decided which one I was going to do, and if you guys want to read up on it so you guys are ready for it, it's going to be in Luke 16, where it's the parable of the unjust steward, and that is one that I've always kind of like wrestled with a little bit, and have, have always had kind of like this hard time, because you have like the, the unjust steward, and then he's going to like, you know, fire his servant, and then the servant goes back out and renegotiates all of the debts of the debtors. So they could, like, he can have favor in their sight. And I was kind of wrestling with it a little bit, and I, I wanted to have a little bit more time to work on it. Um, and at the same time, there was something that God had kind of, like, really, really put on my heart. And it was something, like, it's one of those messages, and I will tell you for the guy who's get, who has the blessing of, like, preparing them, I'm going to tell you each one of these messages are a little bit like a kid, um, where if it sits with you long enough... Um, like, we are the ones, like, I'm the one who takes the benefit of it, right? And there's a lot of times where, like, God will put something so heavy on my heart. So you get, like, a little bit attached to it. And this, like, this specific talk was kind of, like, on my mind, even though I went back and I looked at it. And this was something that I prepared back. And thank you, Rudy. God bless your heart. I greatly appreciate that. <clears throat> because this was something that, and it was funny because I remember the talk. And it just got put, like, he's just like, you know what? Pete, talk about that. So I actually, I went back, so I, I type up all my talks, and this was actually something back in 2000, uh, 2012, which was crazy for me because that was a long time ago. It was like nine years ago. And, um, but it just kind of, and I was kind of reading back through it, and I was kind of getting, and I felt like, okay, God, like there's, there's a purpose behind this, right? So we'll do, just so everyone knows, Unjust Stewart next week, Luke 16. Uh, yeah, next week, Luke 16. It'll be great. But today I want to talk about something completely off topic, something a little bit different, right? Um, and I remember when I was preparing this talk, <clears throat> like I said, it was about 19 years ago, and it was right after a trip that I took my boys to Disneyland. So, um, so Nathaniel, you know, Nathaniel's 14, so if we go back, he was, at the time, he was probably about three, maybe four years old. I remember I had Elijah, Elijah was about two years old, and we were sitting there, we were having a family day at Disneyland. <coughs> and it, we, were on the, we were on the Haunted Mansion, right? And it wasn't the first time we'd been to Disneyland. Um, by the grace of God, my brother Paul works at Disneyland. He used to get us in free all the time back before COVID and restrictions and all this other stuff. So my kids were very spoiled that they had a bunch of Disneyland trips when they were really young. And I, it was like this aha moment because we were on the Haunted Mansion. Like we we're always on the Haunted Mansion. And we're kind of going through it. But like the light switch flipped for Nathaniel, right? Because he was like three maybe about four at this point, and it was the first time where he started realizing what the Haunted Mansion was really about. And I remember specifically, it was at like the very end of the Haunted Mansion where you're sitting in your little, your little, uh, I don't know, little buggy thing, and then like the ghost pops up like he's in the car with you. And it was the first time that Nathaniel was just like, what is going on here? And full on, wigged out, <laughs> like freaked out, started realizing that this whole thing's about ghosts in a haunted house and that they're all around us and all this other stuff. And um, they had a complete, like, meltdown, right? So we're trying to calm the Kim down. We're on our way to Frontierland. Um, we're on our way to actually go watch, like, uh, to, to make our way towards It's a Small World. 
And Nate just wasn't having it, right? Because he was just like, dude, I'm not going on any more rides. This thing is too scary. These rides are scary. There's like demons everywhere and all of this other stuff. And I was about just to say, all right, hey, Christina, you're gonna have to sit this one out. Like, kid doesn't want to go, kid doesn't want to go. Well, I'm going. And um, interestingly enough, well, right when he was about to, to get left, right? <laughs> so me and uh, Elijah can go on like the next ride. And I think Uncle Paul was with us. Um, Nate, it was kind of like, he kind of manned up. He's like, no, 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 all right, come on, we're going to do this. It's a small world. You get set up, it's a small world, safe, this, that, all this other stuff, right? You know, so he, he just got kind of like really, really excited about it, right? So he finally got like, you know, brave enough and excited enough to go on this ride, and he loved it, right? And he loved the ride. It was a great time, and, and thank God he got excited because if he did not make that decision in that point in time, like his, for, his forever view on rides would have been completely different, right? Like it would have been really hard for him to, to get him go, to go on um, other rides. And I was kind of thinking about it and like as, as scared as he was, right? He had no idea what his dad had in store for him, right? Whether it be on that day, on other days, you know, other amusement park days, days of fun, fun things that we were gonna be doing for him. So the first passage we're gonna be going through here is Second Kings, 13 verses 14 through 20 okay and I'll kind of read through it and we'll kind of stop and, and do a little bit of the commentary but 2nd Kings 13 verses 14 through 20 right and Elisha and as you guys all know Elisha came out after Elijah um, his prayer on on his way um, on bef right before he, he took over the mission he says give me a double spirit of Elijah's you know spirit right give me a double portion of Elijah's spirit and as you know as great as Elijah was Elisha came with a double portion, right? So verse 14, it says, Elisha had become sick with an illness that he would die. So we know that this is, this is going to be it for Elisha. Then Joash, the king of Israel, came down to him and wept over his face and said, O oh my father, my father, the chariots of Israel and their horsemen. And Elisha said to them, Take a bow and some arrows. And he took himself a bow and some arrows. And he said to the king of Israel, Put your hand on the bow. So he put his hand on the bow. And Elisha put his hand on the king's hand. So at this point, you know, you know something's happening, right? Like there's a reason that Joash, King Joash had come to Elisha. Israel was in a war. They were losing. So, you know, typically not just King Joash, but all of us, when times get really, really hard, what do we do? We turn to God, right? Tangibly, we might, we might even turn into a man of God. Right? Because what we go, we need help, we need guidance. And like the situation was so desperate, he goes to Elisha, who is sick, but Elisha is also known to be a miracle worker. Right? He had a history. Right? He's raised from the dead. You know, he's done a bunch of crazy stuff. So at this point, he says, you know what? I'm going to this man. I need a miracle. And when Elisha starts telling him, hey, you need, we're going to start doing some weird stuff, you know, Joash should have been all ears. Right? Like he was setting the table. He knew something was going on. Right? Like this is what he came for. And then in verse 17, and he said, open the east window. And he opened it. And Elijah said, shoot. And he shot. And then he said, the arrow of the Lord's deliverance and the arrow of deliverance from Syria. For you must strike the Syrians at Aphak until you have destroyed them. So he tells them. Like this arrow, the arrow that we're holding on to, right? These arrows I told you to got. Like this is, this is the arrow of your deliverance, right? And he knows that this, it's symbolism. He knows it's important, right? And, and it, you got to remember the whole reason is there is because he's losing the battle. Like this, is, like this is everything he was hoping for when he came and knocked on Elisha's door, right? In verse 18, then he says, and I say, take the arrows. So King Joash took them. And he said to the king of Israel, strike the ground. So he struck it three times and stopped. Like there's that, you know, that's, that says there's no part in the Bible, right? There, there's no empty word, right? Like everything has meaning. It says, so he, so he struck three times and stopped. And the man of God was angry with him and said, you should have struck five or six times. Then you would have struck Syria until you have destroyed it. But now you will strike Syria only three times. And then you have like this great life of Elisha, 
right, where he was doing miracles. He did, you know, twice as many miracles as his predecessor, Elijah, who was like the man. And then in verse 20, then Elisha died and they buried him, right? So this was like the final, <laughs> the final, like you have this great man's life, right? And this is how it ended. He was mad because he only struck three times and stopped. And I feel like what Elisha was saying here, right, he was looking at King Joash and said, why weren't you excited? Like, why weren't you passionate? When I told you to do something, why did you just do the minimum, right? Like, why, why just strike three times and like, that's it, right? I told you to beat the ground. And because you only did it, because you, you struck the ground three times, now you will only defeat them three times. See, you weren't excited about it. You just, you just did what I told you to do. You just ran through the routine. You weren't excited about the possibility of what could happen from all of this. Like you saw that I was at work. You saw that God had something for you, right? With the grab me the arrow, open the door, I put my hand on your hand. Like you saw that the, that the, that the stage was set for something to happen. And all you did was kind of whatever. And then you see this huge disconnect, right? Because what Elisha tells him is that like, God was willing to wipe out Syria completely. He was willing to abolish them, right? Like God's plan for you was not to struggle there. Your plan for you, God's plan for you was not continued war. It was victory. Like I wanted victory for you. And if you would have struck it five or six times, you would have had it. And we would have destroyed Syria forever. But you didn't. But you didn't. You struck it three times. And because you only struck it three times, this is something that you're going to continue to struggle with. Right? And I read the story, and I'm not going to lie. There's a part of me where I was like, Elisha, why didn't you just tell him to strike it five or six times? Like, that would have, it would have, it would have done it. If you would have told him specifically, strike it five or six times, you know, then we would have gotten to the same result. But I felt like God was basically saying is like, God's plan still needs our passion. Like, God knows what he wants us to do. But it's our passion, it's how we execute that plan that really, really matters. And, and it's what we see right here. You know, and then when I was thinking about this, I said, you know, here, here's, here's something I just want us to think about. Is there sin in our lives that we are still struggling with that God is not planning or God did not plan us to struggle with? Right? Like, there are sins in our life that God said, I will give you victory here. I will destroy it. It will be gone but it never happened because we never got excited about it? Because we never got passionate about it? Because we never got so gung-ho in the fact that we wanted God to do something so bad, right? That we didn't beat the ground with our arrows, with passion, excitement. Because I will tell you, if that is the case, I'll be the first one to confess that I'm tired of struggling. I'm tired, tired of the war. Like, I want to destroy the opposition here, right? I have, I can relate to Israel continually going back to war with Syria. But if we want that victory, then we better get excited. Because here's something that I think we don't talk about a lot. We always talk about the cross. We say we have to pick up our cross and we have to follow, which is a thousand percent accurate. There is no resurrection without a cross. There is no sanctification without a cross. That is true, right? But when we, oh, when we talk about that, we always talk about the cost, right? Like the cost of picking up your cross, the cost of following Christ. 100% is true. There's a cross. I mean, there's a cost to that a thousand times over. But one of the things that I don't think we talk about, we don't talk about the cost of not being excited. Because when we run through the routines, when we do the bare minimum, I promise you that there is a cost there as well. Imagine how altered the, life's, the, the king's life would have been if he would have been excited 
about beating that arrow on the ground. If he would have given it 100%, it would have changed the rest of that king's life. It would have changed the kingdom, the peace that they experienced, right? Instead, he only beat it three times. And you know what happened after that three times? I can imagine, and this is just Peter imagining, right? I can imagine God of heaven sitting on his throne, looking down on the nation of Israel and said, because you didn't get excited, you were going to wrestle with this for the rest of your life because you had an opportunity, but you didn't get excited, right? And now you can spend the rest of your life in a way that I never intended you to struggle. I intended you to be delivered from it. And there are battles in our lives that God is tending us, that are telling us that we want victory here. You're still, you're still wrestling with the argument. You're still wrestling with the battle. You're still doing all of this stuff because you're not passionate about it. Because you're doing the bare minimum. You're doing only what I told you to do, but you're not doing it with passion and excitement to overcome it, right? Because God knows that he's given us great promises, right? He's given us his word. He says, I know the plans I have for you. This is one of the most overquoted verses in the entire scripture, 29, Jeremiah 29, 11, right? For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you, not to harm you. Plans to give you hope in the future. Who doesn't want that? Who doesn't want that? But what I want to tell you guys is there's this huge disconnect between his plans and our passion. Because a lot of the times we will never achieve his plans without our passion. Like we have to. We've got, we've got to be super gung-ho about it, right? We've got to go all in and not bare minimum. King Josh is just like, look, I just, need, I just need to win this victory. Beat the thing, okay, okay, okay. But he wasn't passionate about it. And I'm going to tell you something, and I believe this is as true as it gets. When God tells you something and he gives you a work to do, and you don't do anything about it. When he calls you to himself, you don't do anything about it. We pay a high cost. We pay a high cost. It costs us a lot. If we don't get fired up, if we don't get excited, if we don't get passionate about transitioning things in our lives, when God tells us to do something, and we don't respond to that all in, when God gives you a word, you better get excited. You can't be passive and you can't be lackluster, right? Because I've, I've seen so many people come back to the church on their hands and knees because something that Satan has done to them. Something where Satan had their way with them, whether it be addiction, drugs, pornography, abusive relationships, divorces, attempted suicides. We've seen it all. And the thing that is always the common thing is like, you know what, that, that God may have given them a work, but they didn't get excited about it. They didn't take it seriously. They may have just done the, the bare minimum. And there's a high cost when God tells us to do something and we don't go all in about it, right? These issues change lives forever. I remember when I was serving in college, there was a girl uh, that, that was in the, in the youth group and she was telling me about a bad relationship that she was caught up in and uh, you know, how sin was like just running rampant in it. And I was just like, I kind of, she just kind of vomited it all out. And I was kind of like, dude, like, do you understand the cost of this? You know, like you need to end it. And she was like, I don't know if I can end it and this and that. And then I love him and all of this other stuff. And I was like, there's a high cost to what you're doing right here. Do you understand? Oh, Peter, you know, this and that and all this other stuff. And I said, do you realize that this, this relationship, the same one that you're talking to me about right now, is something that you're going to have to explain to your future husband. And I think a lot of the times we don't understand that when we are walking these roads, when we are making these decisions, that there is a high cost to not following what God is telling us to do. Right? And I believe that when God tells you to do something, there is a great power that follows in that situation. Right? When Elisha was telling you know, Joash, hey, give me the arrow, put your hand on it. I'm going to put my hand on it too. There is power when God gives you a word. This was not King Joash just beating on his own. It was the entire kingdom of heaven beating down with him. But, he was but even the kingdom of God was basically saying, I will not do 
more than you want to do. Not every moment is an equal opportunity moment in the kingdom of heaven. There are transition moments where I believe that it will, if you take one of these transition moments when God gave you a word and he told you to do something and you execute on that, it will forever change the trajectory of your life. And not our lives, our kids' lives, and it could be a generational thing that moves forward. Not every moment is an equal opportunity moment. So we need to harness them when we can because the opportunity, is, the opportunity cost is great but we always have it wrong. We think it's a great cost when we follow Christ and we're gonna give up so much, but I'm gonna tell you it's the exact opposite. There is a cost when we don't and we see it everywhere around us. Broken people left and right. You know, there's a high cost when we're not excited. But do you know how many times I've seen God work in a person right? And it's clear. And they're sharing with me. And Pete, I feel like God's doing this and God do this. Look at this situation and how all of this played out, right? And they said, but you know what? I'm just, I'm just not ready yet, right? I just need a little bit more time. I just, just, just a little bit longer, right? Or I can't let go of this sin just yet. I, I will get there, but like, I, I can't just yet, right? Like I, I, I'll get around to it. Just, I, I just can't do it now. And all I really hear in times like this is, Pete, I don't have enough scars yet, right? Like, I don't have enough scars yet, right? Like, Satan hasn't screwed me up enough yet. Or, you know, I don't have enough ed addictions yet. Or I'm still looking for a little bit more emotional baggage. Or sign me up for just a couple more consequences when it comes back and it bites me in the butt. And it floors me because all I want to tell these people is there's a high cost. Like when we don't listen, there's a high cost when we don't listen, right? A story that I was thinking about, and for the guys in the men's group, you guys know how I feel about this guy. Um, the story I was thinking about was Esau and Jacob, right? And I kind of, we have this inside joke that Jacob, me and Jacob, when I get to heaven, he's probably not going to talk to me because like... He just didn't do anything right. His whole, like one night he struggled with God. Everything else is like God pursuing him. And, and, and that's the best part of the story is that God will pursue somebody even like Jacob. But the problem is, is he's the good guy in this story, right? Because when you look at the story of Esau and Jacob, right? Esau was the firstborn. And he was the hunter. He was the one that the, the birthright was for him. It was, it was specifically going to the, it should have gone to him 100%. Everybody knew that, right? Abraham gave it to Isaac because Isaac was the firstborn. And Isaac was supposed to give it to Esau. Esau was supposed to give it to his firstborn. That's just the way it worked, right? But to wrap your mind around the fact that today we should be praying to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Esau. That's who we should be praying to. Has anybody ever heard that? No, because something happened, right? Something happened. See, because Esau, he was not excited about spiritual things at all. Okay, he was a hunter, he was a sportsman, and there's nothing wrong with that. But when it becomes the most important thing in your life, where it takes precedence over the other things in your life, when it consumes you as your top priority in your life, then you have a problem. Because in our lives, nothing should be more important than the spiritual. Nothing. Because you have the spiritual and you have the cardinal. Those are the only two categories. So if you put the, if you put the cardinal first, then, then, then you lose. I don't even care what's in that bucket. Because it should always be the spiritual first, right? So Esau had no passion, right? He had no passion for God or the heavenly things, right? He didn't care about God's mission, Right? And I'll be honest with you because a lot of times it freaks me out because I always kind of think about it. I say, okay, well, how passionate are we? Right? Like I hope to God that we, we don't get to the point where prayer and the church becomes boring to us. Because if it becomes boring to us, there's a cost about not being excited. Right? Because the second that prayer and church and, and God's word and all of that stuff gets boring to us, then we start to be a little bit more like everybody else with the exception to the fact that on Sundays we go to church. Go to church. Well, what happened here to Esau is that he wasn't interested in the blessing that God promised to him, 
right? Actually, at all, he didn't care at all about the birthright. All he cared about was hunting, his belly, and other things that really didn't have anything to do, right? But the scriptures, they spoke of his brother because the scripture tells us he had this brother named Jacob. And like I alluded to earlier, Jacob was a cheat. He was a deceiver, right? Honestly, wasn't a very good guy. Deceived almost everybody he came into contact with. But he cared about the birthright. As much baggage as Jacob had, he cared about the birthright. He cared about the spiritual things, right? He wanted the birthright. Then came a day where Esau came in from a hunt and Jacob prepared a bowl of ats. Think about that. Lentil beans, okay? I've never traded anything for a bowl of ats in my entire life, nor would I. As a matter of fact, you probably have to bribe me to eat like a tub of ats. But anyways, Esau traded his birthright for that bowl of ats. Not only did he not care about the spiritual things, he traded it for a bowl of beans. But Jacob, on the other hand, Jacob was excited about spiritual things. Esau didn't, but man, Jacob was willing to do daring things. And if you know the story, he deceived his father. He put on like a bunch of like fur to make him think that he was Esau because Esau was a hairy guy, right? He was willing to do bold things, dangerous things to get the birthright, right? And I'll be honest with you. Esau sold his inheritance cheaply because he wasn't excited about spiritual things at all. And I'm going to tell you that that is something that we need to kind of like apply and see where do we, where do we fit in all of this, right? Because here's the thing that I've realized that Christianity and the way that God calls us to live, it doesn't work if you're sitting on the fence. It doesn't work if you're still eh, not all in, okay? If you're in and you're out, then the Bible will not work for you. You have to be fully committed, fully committed, excited, passionate, everything that you can think of, right? And I will tell you that we pray to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That sounds more like it, right? That's what we recite every single time we're in the church. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, because Esau didn't care much. And I'm going to tell you guys something. At least Esau got the bowl of ats. Because there are times where I'll talk to coworkers, I'll talk to even friends in the church, and they're not trading their birthright. They are not selling their birthright. They are simply giving away their birthright. Remember, the times in your life when your decisions and your actions, you know, we basically tell God that I reject my birthright. I don't want it. Because God is telling us, I want you to live here. This is the life that I've called you for. This is the purpose. This is the plans that I have for you. And then we, unfortunately, like pigs, are in the, pen, are in the pig pen. Doing things that God is saying that that is so below you. What are you even going for? And when we're in that pig pen, you know, rolling around in like, you know, the mud, eating God knows what, what we're basically telling God is, I don't care to be your child. I don't care for your blessings. I don't even want to be in a relationship with you. And I am telling you, when, it, when I find myself in situations like that, I say, at least Esau got the bowl of ats. Because we give it away for nothing. And I wonder, what have we given up our birthright for? And if we look at our lives and we see the compromises and the sins that we choose consistently, what are we giving up our birthright for? Because there's a high cost for not being excited about our God. So on a lighter note, I will tell you, um, during COVID, you know, when we were all kind of sitting at home, um, one of the things that I remi it reminded me of my youth when I was younger is daytime TV, okay? Do you guys miss daytime TV? Like, I, it made me remember how much I missed daytime TV. And it brought me back to one of my favorite shows, one of my sh favorite shows of all time, The Price is Right. Do you guys remember Price is Right? Okay, Bob Barker's gone, but they have Drew Carey now. But I will tell you, it is such an entertaining show. It's probably, you know, you know what my favorite part of that show is? Any guesses? The Wheel. The wheel? What else? The showcase. the showcase Showdown. Okay, I will tell you, guilty pleasure. 
My favorite part of the whole show is when they call the name of the contestant. Okay? And I'm not talking about when they call the name of the contestant and the person gets up, kind of like, you know, brushes themselves off, straightens themselves up because they're on TV, and they slowly make their way down. Who's the guy that I like? I like the guy that, like, dude, like, you call their name, they are, like, jumping up, they are hugging every single person on the row down. Sometimes they're sprinting all the way up, maybe even a trip, get back up. Sometimes they'll attract the host before they even get to the, like, it's, it's, it's really, really entertaining, right? They make a complete fool of themselves. And the reason why I love that person so much yet, like, the, why I just love them so much, is they haven't won anything at all. Like, they haven't won a single thing. No car, no prize, no furniture, no showcase showdown, nothing. They are excited just to have the potential. Just to have the potential. Just the opportunity. Right? And I feel like if you relate that to how we are living, right? Like, we don't get excited until God does something, right? And not only does God have to do something, he's got to do something so big right? That has got to be like a documented miracle, right? And if we get that, we might give him a little bit of praise, a little bit of credit, right? What would our lives look like if we showed up here every week or even better, if we woke up in the morning every single day excited just to have the potential, just the opportunity that God can show up, just the opportunity for us to win, to have, do, to have God do something great with you. Because the reality of it is, is God is willing to do great things with us. God is willing to use us in great ways. He is willing to use us to bless others in an amazing way. But we don't get excited about it. We don't get excited for the opportunity. We don't even look for it. Matter of fact, a lot of the times the opportunity is right in front of us and we just choose not to walk through it. Right? But I want us, this is, this is probably the only takeaway you guys will probably ever remember from this meeting. I want us every morning to wake up like that fool on the, crisis, uh, on the Price is Right. Just to be so excited and say, God, let today be the day. Let today be the day. Just give me a little bit of, just, just that I even have the potential that you can do something with me. Because I will tell you, again, there's a high cost for not staying excited about what God has planned for you. You know, and, and I think that the hardest part of this is in the day that we're living in today, it is hard to stay excited. It's hard. Because if you look everywhere around us, there's bad news. You know, there's no shortage of just regular news. And there's all these distractions. All these things that take the wind out from our sail. Right? Everything around us just tries to steal our joy. And the enemy doesn't want us to stay excited. In John 10.10, 10, it says that the enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy. That is his whole goal. If he can just steal, kill, and destroy your joy. And I think that he does a pretty good job, right? But again, we say that God has a better plan, right? His plan is to prosper, not to harm, and to give us hope in the future. And I was thinking about excited people in the Gospels, right? Like, like characters that we see in the Bible, you could tell that they were excited, right? And the, the, the first story that came to mind was Palm Sunday. You know, Palm Sunday, they see Christ, Hosanna, Hosanna, the healer, the miracle worker, right? And the Pharisees, as we've been seeing through the parables, they weren't having it, right? And they came to him to rebuke him. And he told them that if you, if you get them to be quiet, like the stones are going to cry out. Right? And I was thinking about what that actually meant. And what basically what God was telling the Pharisees is just like, look, I called everybody to get excited. Right? And if they're not excited, I'll find something else to be excited. Right? Like someone's going to be excited. Because there's a high cost to not get excited about what really matters. Right? And if you're honest with yourself, because I had to be honest with myself, right? I get way too excited about worldly things that really don't matter, right? And I think we can all put a name to that, whether it be, you know, 
a, a new job, a new raise, a new possession, a new house, a new car. Like we can get really, really excited about that stuff. But when it comes to get excited about spiritual things, maybe not. So here's what I want us to do. First of all, I'm praying that you guys are, felt that God showed up today in this meeting. I pray that God wrestled with hearts today in the meeting and that he showed areas of our life where he wants us to be a little bit more excited, okay? Where he's telling you, this is what I expect from you personally. Not what Peter's saying, but what God is whispering into every single one of our hearts. And the reason he whispers it is because God's close. He's close, right? Maybe he might even be showing out to you, uh, might be telling you that, hey, there are areas of your life where you might be a little bit too excited and stuff that really doesn't matter. You got a little bit of that Esau in you where you're chasing stuff that like God's saying, look, that's not bad. It just can't be more important than me. Okay? But whatever God's telling you to do, I'm going to ask you to get committed to it, to listen to him, to submit to him where he's telling you, this is what I want you to do. This is where I want you to be excited, right? And like anything in life, if you want results, it needs consistency. We're not talking about doing it once. We're not doing it twice. I'm talking about creating a spiritual rule that this is something that you can start living out consistently. And I want you to be excited about the opportunity. We should be excited at the opportunity that God, the creator of heaven and earth, the Alpha and the Omega, from the beginning of time is speaking to us personally, individually. And he's drawing us into an intimate relationship with him. If that's not exciting to you guys, I, I, I'm out of words. There's nothing else I could say. We need to be excited. And we also need to confess and acknowledge that there is a high cost if we are not excited. And glory be to God forever. Amen. Let's stand up and pray. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, name of God. Dear Lord, we thank you, Lord. We thank you because I know that you have such a great calling for every single one of us in this room, Lord. I know that you have laid out the steps for us, Lord, and no one's ignorant of that. I know, Lord, that your hand is on our hand on the arrow and that you have victory, Lord. You have, there's so much that you want just to fulfill in our life, Lord, and the life of those around us through us, Lord. But I ask that you give us the excitement you give us the passion. You give us, Lord, just a sense of urgency, Lord, that it needs to happen today. Because, Lord, we all know that our greatest joys are the ones that you've given us, Lord, and our greatest disappointments and failures are the ones where we thought that our way was better. So, Lord, I ask that you don't let us, don't let us be like King Joash, Lord, and just run through the motions. Don't let us be like Esau, Lord, where we choose other things over our birthright, Lord. But Lord, I ask that you let us be like that person on The Price is Right, where we are just so full of excitement for the opportunity that we might be able to do something great, Lord. Lord, I ask that you just work through all of our stuff, Lord, all of our issues, our sins, Lord, that you give us a true repentance, that you allow us to confess the things that we need to confess, Lord, that you forgive us these sins, Lord, the recessions of your Holy Virgin Mother, Te Toko, St. Mary, all the saints and martyrs since the beginning. Here's what we pray thankfully. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Through Christ Jesus our Lord, for the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen.